This was Germany, a beautiful country. A historic country. A prosperous country. A modern country. The German people, a clean and tidy people. An educated people. A musical people. people. These people look all right. The mailman, the farmer, the cop. They all look pretty much like the folks back home. Holding down jobs, raising families. Enjoying life? They certainly look like the kind of people we can understand. Or can we? A quiet, decent people who prepared 20 years to bring war into the world? A religious people who burn churches, imprison ministers, persecute the faithful? A kindly people who accept blood purges, pogroms, concentration camps? A gentle people who torture, starve, exterminate. These were men. They died in German concentration camps. Two were men. They did not quite die. These bones were men, women, and children sent to be exterminated in a German death factory. This is a scientifically designed gas chamber. This a furnace for burning the corpses. This the clothing of the victims, which the Germans methodically salvaged. 
These the children's toys, carefully collected for the use of German children. These are objects of art made by German guards. Objects of art made of human skin. These were Poles, murdered by the Germans before they left Lublin. These were Italians, murdered by the Germans before they left Rome. These were Belgians, murdered by the Germans before they left Bandai. These were Americans, defenseless prisoners of war, murdered by the Germans near Malmedy. These are some of the reasons why the German farmer and the German mailman and the German cop can't be quite like the people back home. That's why we've got to look a little deeper into the German character. The character of a people who plunged the world into two wars in one generation and each time claimed that they were victims of attack. That's the puzzle we've got to solve if we're to save our children from a third war. The puzzle of that clean, industrious people, fond of kids, fond of music, fond of tyranny, fond of aggression, fond of gas chambers. What gave the Germans that character? What makes them think, act, feel this way? Hitler would have answered, German blood. We don't take so hopeless a view. Too many of our friends and neighbors have had German blood. That same blood that we have seen in great Americans. For what makes an American is not any special precious sort of blood, but the tradition we have inherited. It's tradition, not blood, that patterns the way we think and act and feel. Our ancestors came here to escape tyranny. That's part of the American tradition. That's why no American can believe in any government that is not of the people, by the people, and for the people. They came to be able to pray in any way they wanted, or in any church they wanted. That's why freedom of religion is part of our tradition. In school, we learned that none of us is any better than any other American, or anybody else in the world for that matter. That there is no privileged few, that all men have equal rights. That's the tradition we were brought up in, at home, at school, among our friends, at our jobs. That is the tradition that has made us what we are. Now, what is the tradition that has made this man? How does it differ from ours? That's what we have to find out. These Germans were selected by Nazi cameras as ideal German types. Let's call one of them Carl Schmidt a self-termed member of the master race who goose-stepped his way across an entire continent. His father did the same goose-step and followed the same road of conquest. And the grandfather of Carl Schmidt did the same goose-step and trod the same path of aggression. The same goose-step, the same will of aggression, the same lust for conquest. You knew their leader as Hitler. Your father knew the leader as the Kaiser. Your grandfather remembers Bismarck. You faced the Nazi menace. Your father's generation was threatened by the Huns. In your grandfather's day, there were the Prussians. The Nazis, the Huns, the Prussians. Three different names for three generations of Germans, attempting to inflict their will upon others by force. Three generations following a tradition so different from ours. Let's go back even further and see how this tradition began. 150 years ago, there was no single country called Germany. Instead, a loose conglomeration of 300 little states without a common history, religion, or literature. In America, even at that time, we were living under the democratic constitution we enjoy today. The British could look back on hundreds of years of parliamentary government. The French had made their revolution in the name of liberty, equality, fraternity. But the 300 little German states were still the property of autocratic princes and ruled without the consent of their peoples. Not one had a constitution, not one had a parliament, 
Not one had freedom of speech or of the press or of assembly. Instead, a rigidly organized medieval society with all power centralized in the hands of the feudal lords. The prime example of this was Prussia, the most aggressive of the German states, where the Junkers, the military caste of landowners, ruled their peasants with iron discipline. To perpetuate this feudal militaristic society, the Prussian king, Frederick the Great, established a rigid code of laws administered by a host of state officials answerable only to him. This was the perfect system to prevent any rise of liberty among his subjects. It was also the perfect system to make possible ruthless aggression against the world. I begin by taking. I shall find scholars afterward to demonstrate my perfect right. And he took. First, he invaded Prussia's brother country, Austria, without a declaration of war. Result, victory. For seven years, he fought single-handed against Austria, Russia, Sweden, and France. Thus creating throughout the other German states the myth that Prussian arms were invincible. In 1786, Frederick died, but Frederick's state and Frederick's dream of conquest lived on, nurtured and developed by the Prussian militarists, who regarded each war as only one campaign in an unending war for Prussian supremacy in Europe. To this end, Scharnhorst, the organizer, and Gneisenau, the strategist, established the Prussian general staff. Von Clausewitz, the theorist, set down their gospel in his famous book, von Krieger, on war. Just as Prussia has been fated to be the core of Germany, so Germany will be the core of the future German Empire of the West. Clausewitz's book became the Bible of the Prussian militarists. Conquered people shall be left with nothing but their eyes to weep with. But even as the militarists were plotting, a wave of liberalism swept over Europe. Its eddies reached even Prussia and ordinary men began to think for themselves and to demand what had long been accepted in America, England, and France, a constitution. The King of Prussia answered, never must a scrap of paper come between me and my subjects. A constitution, a scrap of paper. Some citizens determined on liberty went to the barricades. The machinery of the Prussian state went into action. The revolt died. The will to liberty was not strong enough within the people to defy the voice of authority. One result of which, men with a love of liberty began to leave Prussia and the other German states. In the next 30 years, two million of them came to find freedom in the United States alone, while their cousins, remaining behind, were molded into ruthless automatons, ready to follow blindly the will of a leader and that leader arose. Otto von Bismarck, appointed Prime Minister of Prussia in 1862. A clever man, a shrewd man, but devoted to the Prussian dream of conquest and a master of the Prussian method of achieving it. The great questions of the day will not be decided by resolutions of majorities, but by blood and iron, and to go with it, ruthless discipline at home. As soon as anybody can show me that it is sound policy, I shall be equally satisfied to see our troops fire at the French, the Russians, the English, or the Austrians. Two years after Bismarck became prime minister, he provoked a war against Denmark. The 
result, victory. Two years later, against Austria. Result, another victory. Four years later, the great test against France. An amazed world stood by as Prussia, until then a minor power, dared to challenge the strongest nation in Europe. Result, another victory. was the moment of triumph that changed the history of the world. The Prussian dream of conquest was no longer a dream. The German princes saw the Prussian eagle soaring triumphant in the European sky. Now they clambered on the bandwagon and united under Prussian leadership to form the German Empire. And in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, heart of defeated France, Bismarck saw his Prussian king crowned German emperor absolute monarch of a new empire founded on blood, iron, and conquest. Its symbol, Victoria, emblem of victory. Not the Liberty Bell, not the Magna Carta, not Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, not any symbol of freedom, but Victoria, the symbol of conquest. Thus, Prussia had created Germany and the myth of Prussian superiority had become the myth of the master race. And if the Carl Schmidt of that generation had any worries about the liberties that had been denied him, they were now forgotten. In this moment of triumph, just to be a German was enough. In the newly created Reich, industry flourished as never before. The merchant fleet grew larger every day. German harbors were jammed with commerce and German stomachs filled with beer and sausage. Germany had achieved unity, become rich, no other country threatened her. The world hoped for a peaceful good neighbor. But the world had forgotten the Prussian tradition that Germany had inherited, a tradition not of peace and friendship, but of war and conquest. And by now, Carl Schmidt of the second generation, the father of the Carl Schmidt we had to fight, was arrogantly singing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, Germany, Germany over all, as he proudly watched his fatherland becoming the most aggressively nationalistic country in the world. Industry was carefully controlled to accord with the policies of the great general staff. For in the new Reich, Bismarck had added a fourth pillar to the structure of the warlike state. Frederick's militarists, landowners, and state officials had been joined by the big industrialists. A gigantic railroad system was laid out, more according to strategic war plans than the necessities of peacetime trade. One of the largest navies was constructed. The army was built up to staggering proportions. And the German officer was the idol of the nation, the personification of German ambition. In German colleges, the sport of German youth was not football, but the deadly duel. The scar was the badge of honor. The more scars, the handsomer. Did they not prove the man's prowess in arms? And contentedly watching all stood the great general staff, still directed by the Prussian Junkers, secure in the knowledge that their power and authority was indisputable. Germany was geared for war.
All it needed was a new leader to give the word. And again, that leader was at hand. William II of Hohenzollern, the Kaiser that your father knew. Not a shrewd, clever cynic like Bismarck, but a vain and arrogant braggart, yet a leader in the German tradition. We Germans like to bear arms, and we like the game of war. I shall enlarge your borders. And what did Carl Schmitt's father say to all this? A German spark has always ignited the fire. Soon everything will be aflame. Through one international crisis after the other, the Kaiser rattled his sword, loudly demanding Germany's place in the sun. In vain, the other powers proposed an international agreement for general disarmament. But disarmament didn't suit the plans of the German militarists, landowners, state officials, or industrialists. They wanted their own way, and their own way meant war. War, therefore, was inevitable. It only needed an incident. How did this second generation Carl Schmidt react to the prospect of a world war? Berlin took on the air of a carnival. Blindly, joyfully, the people cheered the Kaiser, eager to follow a leader on the renewed march to conquest. Thus, in August of 1914, Carl Schmidt of the second generation, indoctrinated with 150 years of Prussian tradition, marched off to set the world aflame. Had he not been taught, did he not believe that whatever Germany demands is right? Even when he marched through Belgium, dismissing a solemn neutrality pact as a scrap of paper. Even when German scientists developed poison gases in violation of international agreements which Germany had solemnly signed. Even when in violation of all the agreed codes of war, German U-boats deliberately sent to the bottom unarmed merchant ships without warning. Thus, what his father had done to France, to Denmark, to Austria, this second generation Carl Schmidt attempted to do to the world. Our own President Wilson said, I was, for a little while, unable to believe that such things would in fact be done by any government that had subscribed to the human practices of civilized nations. But only when we realized that we were directly threatened, only when every protest had been ignored, and Germany had carried the war right into our home waters, did we feel compelled to fight.
finally under the combined attack of the allies the german army started to crumble to fall back to run from back germany was at the mercy of the allies general von ludendorff the german chief of staff and virtual dictator was forced to send a secret message to the berlin government the offer of peace must be transmitted immediately the army cannot wait another 48 hours the allies could grant the armistice or fight on to unconditional surrender. Georges Clemenceau, the wartime French leader, urged that the Allies should march triumphant into Berlin. Our own General Pershing said, complete victory can only be obtained by continuing the war until we force unconditional surrender. But the world would not listen. So golden was the thought of peace that the armistice was granted. We celebrated. Not only because the war was over, but because it seemed that we had put an end to German militarism forever. Hadn't the German army been beaten? Hadn't the German plan for conquest failed? Hadn't the Kaiser had to run away to Holland and his war leader Ludendorff to seek refuge in Sweden? And wasn't Germany now a republic, apparently like our own, based on liberty and equality? Didn't that prove that Carl Schmidt had rid himself of the old German tradition? That's what your father thought as he celebrated in 1918. But let's see what had really happened. When defeat was imminent, the men who had caused the war stepped conveniently into the background, leaving the weak opposition parties to take over. That was how, overnight, Germany became a republic. It had elected representatives, all the appearances of democracy. But beneath the surface, the old German system went on as before. The state officials of the Kaiser's empire were the state officials of the new republic. The industrialists of the empire ran the industry of the republic. Even the same teachers presided over the same classrooms, preaching the same gospel of nationalism and German racial superiority. And above all, the general staff of the empire continued to function, even though secretly. The old Germany still lived, and Karl Schmidt, too, had never really changed. In the first place, he never believed that his armies had been defeated. During the four years of the war, he had been told only of an unending string of victories. News of defeat had been kept from him. And when the fighting ceased, wasn't his glorious army still on foreign soil? Germany itself still uninvaded? And because Germany was granted an armistice instead of being forced to unconditional surrender, Karl Schmidt never saw Allied soldiers marching through his capital. Instead, the German army, home again after the armistice, bands playing, colors flying. Like the army of Frederick the Great. Like Bismarck's army. certainly not like a conquered army. Why then had Germany signed an armistice, Karl Schmidt asked himself. Why a year and a half later, what he called the shame treaty of Versailles? Why was Germany, in his judgment an undefeated Germany, accepting the penalties of defeat? Bitter, self, Karl Schmidt was looking for a scapegoat. He found one the one the German war leaders had always planned that he should find. Karl Schmidt never blamed the men who had caused the war. Instead, he blamed the men who had signed the peace. Thus, in Karl Schmidt's distorted thinking, the ill-fated German Republic meant a bunch of traitors that had stabbed the fatherland in the back. And the general staff, the great landowners, the industrialists, the state officials smiled contentedly. Not only had they escaped blame themselves, but they had smeared the idea of democracy in Germany. It was a blow from which it would never recover. Karl Schmidt would go back to the old tradition, the tradition of Frederick and Bismarck and the Kaiser, the tradition of militarism and war. But wasn't the Versailles Treaty designed to prevent Karl Schmidt starting another war, even if he wanted to? By this treaty, the Germans agreed to disband the general staff, to limit their army to 100,000 men, to hand over their fleet, to demilitarize the Rhineland and coastal fortifications. 
They bound themselves never again to build an air force or submarines. And to enforce the treaty, Allied troops were to occupy the west bank of the Rhine, the Cologne sector for five years, the Koblenz sector for 10, the Mainz sector for 15. Further, there was the League of Nations designed to prevent Germany or any other country from starting a war of aggression. Yet, only 20 years later, the Karl Schmitts of our generation were on their way again for another try at smashing the world into submission. How was Karl Schmitt able to rearm so quickly? Like every other country after the last war, Germany faced hard times. But in Germany, careful manipulation made its results much worse for the millions of Karl Schmitts. Inflation made clever financiers rich and canceled the huge debts of the big landowners. It broke Karl Schmitt. Then came the Depression. That cost him his job. So hunger was added to his resentment and bitterness. This was the moment for which the unholy quartet had waited. Now the militarists, the landowners, the state officials, the industrialists emerged from their self-sought obscurity. Their plans were ready. Now they went to work. What is the cause of your trouble, shouted Schacht of the Reichsbank, the Treaty of Versailles. Who signed the treaty, asked the reactionary newspapers, the Democrats. And why are you starving, said Krupp, the munitions king, to pay for reparations. Who started the war, said the crown prince, the French. Who lost the war, asked Hindenburg, the Democrats, the communists, the traitors. And Carl Schmidt listened. He was hearing the story he wanted to hear. He was victim of a vast conspiracy, he told himself. The world was against him. Once again, he was being taught to hate. Once again, he was thirsting for revenge. And revenge was possible because the world allowed him to tear up the Versailles Treaty, clause by clause. Instead of enforcing it, we Americans refused to sign it and withdrew our army of occupation after only nine months. The British, even though Germany was consistently violating it, pulled out after five years. The French made one final attempt to enforce the treaty and marched into the Ruhr. But this made them so unpopular in a world drenched with heartbreaking German propaganda that they withdrew sullenly behind their Maginot line. Now, let's see what would have happened had the treaty been enforced. Without a general staff, Germany could not have planned World War II. From a demilitarized Rhineland, she couldn't have attacked France or the Low Countries. Without an air force, she could not have blitzed Britain. With an army of 100,000, she could not have attacked the Soviet Union. Without submarines, she could not have threatened our own Atlantic lifeline. But the Treaty of Versailles was not enforced. And as for the League of Nations, we refused to join it. And other countries paid it little more than lip service. So once again, the Germans began to march. Not in the open at first, but on disguised drill fields, masquerading as patriotic veteran organizations, or as the so-called Technical Auxiliary Corps, ostensibly formed to help in case of strikes, or as Ein Bonerwehr, vigilante groups claiming to protect the citizens against communism, or in school, simply under the name of calisthenics, but always under the supervision of army officers. The old German tradition was on its way back. But to the victorious allies, the German leaders sang a different tune. Peace, friendship, and a piteous cry for help. Germany's hate is the fate of the world. Germany's distress is the distress of the world. The prosperity of the individual nations is the prosperity of all. I hope one day to come over to America and visit your beautiful country myself. The Germany political and economical situation today is extremely difficult. This is the result not only of having lost the World War, 
but above all the outcome of the fact that Germany's former enemies are oppressing here above endurance. And when the German leaders whined they were too poor to pay reparations, we believed them. Result, not only did they not pay one penny, but they received additional billions granted them in loans. It didn't occur to most of us that they would use this money to build up their industry for another war. We began to sympathize with Carl Schmidt. Why should he suffer because his father started a war? Maybe the Versailles Treaty wasn't fair. Maybe the French had been too tough. Or maybe it was the British. Or maybe Wilson wasn't very practical. Once again, we were determined to see only the pleasant side of the German character. This clean and tidy people. This musical people. This industrious people. This historic country. This beautiful country. But behind this peaceful facade, the Germans prepared again for aggression. Germany began to rearm. Its leaders planned the death blow for the German Republic. True, they had already taken it over for their purposes, installing the aged von Hindenburg as president. But it was still in structure a democracy, and that meant liberals and unions and free speech and a free opposition. And the German leaders knew, as Frederick and Bismarck and the Kaiser had known, that you can't start ruthless aggression abroad without ruthless discipline at home. Therefore, the time had come for the Republic to be eliminated. To achieve this, they needed a tool with which to appeal to the Germans' old passion for superiority and conquest. Not a feudal monarch this time like Frederick, nor an aristocratic landowner like Bismarck, nor an emperor like the Kaiser, but an ex-corporal of the German army with a fanatic gleam in his eye and the power to arouse a mob. Preaching the same old doctrine as his predecessors. The old doctrine that had never failed to arouse the German people. Himself jobless, uneducated, cowardly, resentful. Hitler gathered around him misfits like himself. People obsessed with grievances real or imaginary. People who weren't as prominent as they thought they should be. People with inferiority complexes who wanted to shout with a crowd. People who wanted power but were too lazy to work for it. Sheep anxious to be led. Dope addicts. Perverts. Bullies. Cranks. Unfortunately, those Germans who were liberally minded regarded Hitler as either a joke or a nuisance. But the German nationalists well knew his possibilities. They knew that he was capable of administering the death blow to the German Republic, of forging the German people into a single mold. Backed by the militarists who saw in him their chance to build a mighty war machine, backed by the monarchists who saw in him their chance to restore the Hohenzollerns to the throne, backed by big business who saw in him their chance at economic domination of the world, backed by thousands of ordinary Germans who saw in him their chance to strut as conquerors across the world. With the backing of all these groups, Hitler soared ahead, skillfully appealing to the German tradition, the old cry of the master race, the Nazis promised all things to all men. To the workers, they promised higher wages. To the employers, lower wages. To the tenants, they promised lower rents. To the landlords, higher rents. To the farmer, higher prices. To the consumer, lower prices. But most of all, they promised revenge on the world, that Germany would become its most powerful empire. Hitler to his audience. And by 1933, the Nazis received more votes than any other political party. And von Hindenburg installed Hitler as its leader, as German chancellor. 
This was the death blow the nationalists had planned. From that moment, the German Republic was dead. Four weeks later, the Nazis set fire to the Reichstag and screamed that the crime had been committed by the communists. Using this as an excuse, Hitler declared a state of emergency and assumed dictatorial powers. From this, it was only a step to the abolition of all political parties. In the new Reichstag, there was only one party, Hitler's party. In the new Reichstag, there was no debate. The deputies were stooges who applauded, got paid, went home. Trade unions were abolished. Instead, the German labor front to discipline the workers and teach them what to think. Music, literature, all outlawed or destroyed unless it supported what the German leaders were trying to sell. Scientists, physicians, their professions were banned to them unless they supported the Nazi ideology. Bismarck had added the industrialist as the fourth pillar of the warlike state. Hitler added a fifth, the professional gangsters, armed thugs to enforce his decrees. And as the German officer had been the ideal of the Kaiser's Germany, the stormtrooper became the idol of Hitler's. Persecution was on the march. Freedom of speech? Now that meant the concentration camp, torture, death. Freedom of religion? Riots and church burnings. Freedom of opinion? The executioner and his acts. Freedom of the press? The Gestapo took care of that. Now Carl Schmidt could be indoctrinated like his father and his grandfather before him. But this time, even more thoroughly, more efficiently, with all the resources of science and the modern state. The German press became a Nazi press. The German airwaves open only to Nazi voices. Nazi papers, Nazi books, Nazi pamphlets. These were all the people could read. Nazi speeches, Nazi dramas, Nazi music. These were all the people could hear. The art of Germany, the sculpture, the paintings, the drama, all regimented to serve one purpose, the indoctrination of Carl Schmidt. One voice only must be heard by Carl Schmidt. One voice from the cradle to the grave, the voice of Hitler. Hitler, Hitler. Scores of microphones and cameras were used to photograph Hitler and record his voice so that all of Germany and others throughout the world could receive his message of hate and hypocrisy. So Hitler was photographed from the front, from the back, from the right, from the left, from every angle. Hitler, Hitler, Hitler. Hitler sobbing, Hitler smiling, Hitler shouting, Hitler working his people into a frenzy. In my schools, a youth will grow up before which the world will shrink back. There must be no tenderness in youth. I want to see in their eyes the gleam of the beast of prey. Brutality is respected. I shall spread terror. Today, Germany. Tomorrow, the world. That's how Carl Schmidt got his soul. That's how the general staff, the big industrialists, the state officials, the landowners, the gangster chieftains, put their plans into effect and prepared Carl Schmidt for his generation's attempt to smash the world into submission. That's how Carl Schmidt was trained for conquest, just as his father was trained by the leaders of his generation and his father before him. Each generation accepting and adding to the German tradition, the tradition of ruthlessness and medieval barbarism, the tradition of a master race, 
the tradition of German superiority, a false picture of the world inside German heads. These are some of the explanations for the murdered Poles in Lublin. The murdered Italians in Rome. The murdered Belgians at Bandai. The murdered Americans at Malmedy. And these are the reasons why in our generation nearly 30 million men have had to die. Because deep in the soul of Carl Schmitt has been planted the love of aggression and conquest. And unless that passion is uprooted, 10, 20, or 100 years hence, a new generation of Germans will find a new leader who will show them the way. How shall that be prevented? A sound beginning has been made. This time, things are being done differently. At the end of the last war, an armistice by negotiation. This time, unconditional surrender. Today, Carl Schmidt knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was defeated. At the end of the last war, German armies parading through Berlin. This time... The legend of German invincibility lies once and for all a shattered myth. After the last war, the German general staff continued to function. Today, not only the general staff, but the entire German officers corps will be dissolved and they will be forever prevented from plotting another German attempt at world conquest. After the last war, German industry was unimpaired. Today, much of it lies in ruins, and such undamaged industrial plants as are permitted to operate will operate under allied control. After the last war, the same state officials remained in office. Today, any Nazi is forever barred from having authority. After the last war, the Kaiser found refuge in Holland, and anyone else who thought they were in any danger ran away. Today, proven war criminals must answer for their crimes. After the last war, German education was untouched. Today, all Nazi doctrine has been destroyed. New textbooks prepared for German youth, under our direction, not the Germans. After the last war, this small area of Germany was occupied. Today, every square inch is under the authority of allied troops. At the end of the last war, this was the government of Germany. Today, this is the government. We have come to Germany not as liberators, but as conquerors. And this time we shall remain for 10 years, for 20, if necessary forever. Carl Schmidt himself will determine how long. For we shall not leave until Carl Schmidt has come to realize that he himself is responsible for not only the past, but the future. We have rid him of Hitler and the general staff and Nazism and militarism. But we have not rid him of Frederick and Bismarck and the Kaiser, of his history and his tradition. That he must do for himself. Until he does, he is still a potential enemy of civilization. Only when he does can he take his place in the society of man. Then and then only will the German farmer, the German mailman, the German cop be like the folks back home. Then and then only can beautiful Germany, industrious Germany, cultured Germany, join the peaceful nations of the world.